Okay, now the first thing we want to do is just get our knife in there and open up this box. So just put it along the seam and it should pop right out. Now, once you've got your drone out, you want to go ahead and season up those blades. So get your salt and pepper in there and give it a nice coverage. Mm, that's it. Now, we're free to start applying power to the blades. First, we need to get our drone hovering and it's being pulled down to the surface by gravity. So with the four propellers contributing, we can get each one to output a thrust of mass times the gravity over four. Now, we don't actually have control over the thrust directly. We must do this by applying power to the motors. Applying power will get the propellers to spin at a certain speed, which will create the thrust we want. Propeller speed converts to thrust through this equation. So it's a quadratic relationship. And this term K here isn't really a scientific thing. It's just number salad to represent how efficient our propeller is at moving the air. Next, we take our spin rate and convert that to power. Now the power required to maintain a certain spin rate is equal to that spin rate multiplied by the torque acting on it, which in this case is the air resistance against the blades. This air resistance scales with the spin rate squared. So when we multiply it with the third spin rate term, this comes out as spin rate cubed. And again, we multiply that with another K number. This time to express how much our blades will drag through the air. This is a theme you will encounter constantly when you deal with applying maths to the air. Air might seem like this highly unpredictable and emotional thing, but it's actually quite weak. So as long as we summarize it well enough, we can kind of skirt around that. So what we've done here is formed a chain of equations. We don't have direct control over the thrust, but once we know how much we want, we can use that to set what we do have direct control over, which is the power output. So by propagating through this chain, we can now overcome gravity. While this is certainly impressive, you'd be surprised how useless this system is. One tiny nudge off level and the drone's taken a nosedive. So we're gonna have to put this aside for a bit and focus more on the rotational control. We've also been using our drone for a while, so make sure you get your salt and pepper back in there and season up those blades to keep it running smoothly. Now, let's pretend that it's suspended in place for a moment. So far, we've been applying the same thrust to each propeller. So what happens if we apply different thrusts? When the thrust isn't equal on all four propellers, one of them will try to accelerate faster than the others. This will cause an imbalance in torque, causing the drone to start spinning. As bad as this might seem, this is a useful property of quadcopters that we will now take advantage of. So let's say we know which way the drone is facing and we want it to face another way. Visually, this is fairly obvious. We need to create a torque going this way, but as far as the drone is concerned, it just sees two 3D vectors. So let's look at the mathematical equivalent to this. First, we are going to take the cross product of these two vectors, giving us this new axis. I've talked about this concept on the channel before, but essentially spinning an object in 3D is the same as skewering an object and rolling the skewer through your fingers. Do you see how the apple seems to rotate around it? It's very similar to a top spinner. Now, if I stick this skewer along the cross product, do you see how that created the rotation we wanted? We can exploit this property of cross products to figure out how to rotate our drone. We are going to use this spin axis as a reference for how much thrust each propeller will output. So I'm gonna go ahead and do another cross product, this time with the spin axis and the current direction of the drone. This will give us a fourth vector, which I like to call the joystick axis. Why do I call it that? Well, let's look at this from the drone's perspective. The joystick axis actually corresponds to which propellers need to be turned on. In fact, by measuring how close each propeller is to this axis, we can figure out exactly how much thrust needs to be applied to each one. On the opposite end, we can simply apply the opposite thrust. It's very important to balance the thrusts out like this, because if we don't, then the drone will no longer rotate in place and start moving around. Even with the right thrusts being set, there is still another problem here. The drone will rotate to its destination with way too much momentum and simply spin past it. This is similar to driving a car with only your accelerator. We are now moving down the road, but ignoring the traffic lights. So we're gonna need some brakes. So we're gonna go ahead and pop a PID controller out uh, and make sure you give this a good season before you put it inside the drone. PID controllers are like car drivers. They attempt to move an object that can only be controlled through an acceleration or a braking force. 
and they come in three components. Number one, the proportional control. This provides the fundamental force. It simply measures how far we are from the target and provides a force towards it. The integral. This is a sum of the proportional control, a force that builds up over time. It's very dusty because no one ever uses this. And finally, the derivative. This measures how fast we are going towards or away from our target. This is typically used to provide a braking force if the speed gets too high. Now, PID controllers are not a one-size-fits-all solution. We will need to balance out these forces so that they can effectively work together. Or in other words, we will need to tune the PID to make sure it's robust. Now, implementing this into our drone is fairly easy. The angle between the drone and our target direction will be the input into the PID controller. And then we can link the output to scale the thrusts we've already calculated. Combining everything together like this results in some really snappy rotational controls. And as far as the project goes, this is the last time we'll have to worry about the rotation. We are now ready to take our drone over the water. So we can go ahead now and prepare our water by adding a little bit of salt in there. Now, normally electronics are waterproof for emergencies, but they definitely aren't salt waterproof. So make sure you get that water in nice and salty. I like to take this time to really appreciate my surroundings. So just soak it in. The water, the beautiful flowers, the perfectly sculpted woodlands. Mm, so lovely. Let's consider the drone's linear movement. Our drone exists in one spot, which we will call A. And let's say we want to move it to another spot, which we will call B. How is this done? We can actually use a second PID controller here, but this time we will use it on a set of three dimensional points. Let's go through the components of this one. The proportional term will simply measure the difference between these two vectors, or in other words, B minus A. The integral will simply sum all of the B minus A's we calculate. This component will be useful now as it will help correct the course should we encounter something unexpected such as a strong wind or a damaged propeller. The derivative will simply measure the drone's velocity, which is also a 3D vector. This will allow us to tell how quickly we are arriving at B and stabilize the flight as we get closer. Once we've considered all the subcomponents, we are left with this control force vector, which, much like our rotational controller, provides some smart acceleration towards the target. Alone, this force won't work as our drone will still fall, so we will combine it with a counter force to gravity, which will give us our full control force. Now, for the final step, applying this to our drone. In order to provide a force this way, we must tell the rotational controller to orient the drone to this direction. Once we have something close to this, we can add the control force to the drone by adding a quarter of it to each propeller's thrust output. The result of all of our hard work is a drone which can navigate its way through the air and arrive safely at our destination. Quite a sight for our lovely Patreons. Now we set out our landing area with plenty of salt and pepper and gently guide our drone to its resting spot. What we've been building up to here is a system that we can use to draw a dot in the sky. So let's say for a moment that we don't just have one drone, but 400. Using this fleet, we can place up to 400 dots in the sky and assign a unique drone to each one. And while we're at it, we can also start adding colors as well. And this is now a matter of creativity. All of the technical work is done. We just need to throw the right shapes up there to resemble a dragon. So here is my approach to that. First, we will trace a loop through the sky. This dictates where the dragon will be in midair. And since dragons from Chinese mythology are long, we will specify a portion of this loop that the dragon will always take up to get that sort of winding effect. Next, we will design the body parts. Here we can model and shade the head, the legs, and the tail. These will simply be rigid structures that are placed at specific points along the body. I've decided to color these with yellow and red, with some occasional green and white detailing. The actual body can be designed in a more procedural manner. Instead of a rigid model, I'm going to wind a spiral from the neck to the tail. This will give the illusion of a solid structure while also following the shape of the curve. And just for a bit of extra flair, let's give it some red scales running along the top to really pump up that dragon's physique. Now for the cherry on top. Remember that loop we traced? Well, let's start slowly moving through it. As you can see, this tiny change has brought the dragon to life. 
And what a sight it is. It is truly incredible how a fleet of drones can work together to create something so beautiful. All that's left to do now is admire the view. Oh, and the drone show I've also prepared for you. So enjoy. Brilliant is a digital education platform that specializes in courses on STEM subjects. Whether it be maths, programming, science, or AI, Brilliant has thousands of lessons to choose from. What separates Brilliant from other platforms is its approach to learning. Trying to pay attention to hour-long lectures can be difficult or even annoying. Brilliant manages to keep you engaged with interactive lessons, allowing you to learn at your own pace, and more importantly, stay engaged. It doesn't even take that long either. Even just a few minutes a day is enough to make a huge difference. As long as you're willing to do it, Brilliant makes that commitment as easy as possible. Recently, Brilliant updated its math courses, helping you develop a much stronger foundation in algebra. This essential skill in maths is much easier than you think, and it'll help you get a foothold in other topics such as linear algebra or even calculus. Not interested? Maybe you'll like their programming courses, learn how to think like a programmer, or even develop a sixth sense for computer logic. Brilliant makes it easy. Use brilliant.org slash b2studios to get a 30-day trial. And if you buy the annual premium subscription, you'll get 20% off. What are you waiting for? Join now and start learning. <laughs> 